thinking of investing, working, or starting a business in the cannabis industry? We've got you covered right here on Plant Problems. Hosted by Tony Frischconnect, Plant Problems takes a different approach to cannabis than what you're seeing and hearing from the mainstream media. Come along with Tony and be in the know about how to invest, work, or start a cannabis business. Let's get the show started with your host, Tony Frischconnect. Hey everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Plant Problems. I'm your host, Tony Frisch Connect. Guys, please, if you want to follow us and you're enjoying what you're hearing, please click the subscribe button uh, for the podcast or the YouTube channel. Uh, that's really the only way you can get alerts when we have new stuff coming out. Uh, also following some of our our past guests, which I'm excited to, to have some past guests here today. I've had them on a couple times. I've actually had uh, uh, Chris Gellard and Matt Gellard on pot plant problems when I first started my, my podcast and I just had Matt on it about six months ago. And the reason we're bringing these two back is they're kind of on this journey, right? And, and I've been getting a lot of great feedback from what they're doing and I really enjoy it partially because this takes me back to, uh, you know, the days when, when I was just starting up. So this is exciting stuff. Uh, and I hope you guys are going to, uh, you know, grasp on this, this stuff because it's very useful knowledge that they're sharing with us. So if you haven't let, heard the last couple of episodes that they've been in, they were at the beginning of the podcast. I'm thinking my first, it was probably the first 10 to 15 episodes. They were right in there. And then we had Matt on here. I believe it was between 60 episodes, 60 and 70. And now we're going into what is going to be episode 99. So I'm happy to have these guys here. So I've got Matt and Chris Gellard from Jamico LLC. They actually started back in the, the company. They started back in 2018, but they have decades of knowledge. So guys, welcome to Plant Problems. How are we doing today? Thank you. Thank you, brother. We're stoked to be here. Thank you for having us, Tony. We super appreciate the opportunity and we're happy to see you again. Uh, yeah, yeah you, me Tony. too. It's been uh, a busy six months and I uh, appreciate being on the show again. This is awesome. Yeah. The, so last time we left talking with Matt, you know, you guys had half an acre greenhouse, Nexus greenhouse that you spent all this money on and you were waiting for state approval. And that that's a big deal. I mean, that's like, Absolutely. oh my gosh, I'm sweating. We can just <laughs> taste it now. Please let us grow some plants. So yeah. this was talking with uh, Matt. This was supposed to, the process was supposed to happen back in January. What happened with state approval? How long did that take for you guys to get? So December, uh, late December, we got our final inspection. They came through. They gave us a really fine tooth comb. They looked at all our SOPs. They, they looked at our camera layouts. They uh, were looking for any deficiencies they could find. Uh, luckily, they didn't find any. Uh, and they said they have to do some paperwork and pass it on to the higher ups. And they couldn't tell us how long of a turnaround it would be until we got our final license. Uh, and then it came to January 15th. We got the email saying that we could commence operations, which was absolutely amazing. It was a very fun day. So, that's yeah, so that was like a week or two after we talked then, right? Exactly. Exactly. So that's kind of when I took a little sigh of relief and thought my job was going to get a little bit easier. <laughs> and uh, I passed off the range to Chris and said, hey, Chris, we got to grow some plants now. Yeah. Uh, we popped uh, maybe 1,500 seeds. I'll, I'll let Chris take a, a little bit on this one. Yeah. So, yeah, so, started- so, so people that haven't listened to you, Chris, so Chris is, has a, a big majority of the growing background not matt does too but chris has also spent a significant amount of time in the hydroponic world so you guys can do a little bit of research on him if you're interested in following up on him on our our first couple of podcasts but continue chris yeah so we got the go ahead from the state and our our thought was instead of bringing clones into the facility that we would go ahead and start from seed from good fresh healthy stock from from a well-known source of genetics right so we got yeah i think 1250 seeds we started you know and 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 initially we had thought we're going to grow three thousand plants one plant per square foot was our thought Mm -hmm. um but we knew we wanted to start 
on the lighter side for airflow just to kind of get our you know our bearings about us so we went well this is this is planned. this is also your first time in a big greenhouse like this right yeah, i mean yeah. absolutely yeah it, it's a 3800 square foot greenhouse we have 3200 square foot of benches and our business plan said uh, a very small plants uh, a plant per square foot uh, we said we're going to take this easy uh, hope we're going to do a third of what we can smash out of that house and we're just going to do uh, a thousand plants so chris said uh, he's the head grower he knows all the knowledge he said this is what we're going to run and this is how many seeds we're going to run with this return rate so, uh, so we started, yeah, 1,250 yeah. seeds and hoping to have a better part of 1,000 ready to, to grow. What was the best part about, I mean, what was the most positive part about starting with seeds? So people understand why you did that because it's time consuming. Yes and no. I mean, it's, you know, the way I look at it, it's half a dozen in one and six in the other in the sense okay. that, you know, we know we're going to get started on the right foot, right? Whereas mm -hmm. unless we had a tissue culture source, where we knew we had, you know, a plant that was free of hoplite and viroid, free of broad mites, free of pottery mildew, free of mm -hmm. rips and mites. You know, these were problems that we figured we, if we started from a clean seed, um, that we've had less of a chance of incurring those sorts of problems. So, and then, uh, and it's really within two weeks, you know, and especially in the format that we're growing in this high intensity environment that they grow quick, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if I plant a seed, you know, today and I plant a cutting today, in two weeks, they're not going to be that much different, right? From my perspective as a mm -hmm. grower. And, and the um, seeds often more healthy. Yeah, they they're, they're have a lot of seed vigor, right? It, and then we had a big issue too that uh, on the January 15th, roughly, uh, they said, you guys can start. Uh, we're going to open up the metrics window. Uh, and there's a, <laughs> there's a Virgin Mary thing that happens, which is kind of funny. Uh, they allow us uh, 48 hours, three days or something like that to populate our inventory into metrics. And that's our lifelong in metrics inventory. So at that time, we had a choice. Do we bring in a bunch of clones? Do we bring in 3,000 clones that have been growing in another location? And if those 3,000 clones are growing in another location, that's most likely a, an illegal grow that they're coming from. It seemed like the most legal and the most... So with the seeds, we were able to populate into metrics. We, we ended up going out and shopping around and we got 10,000 feminized seeds a, of a couple of different varieties that we really liked a, mm -hmm. and put, put those into metrics. So now we have a bank that we can pull off of for the next year. And so for people that don't know what metrics is, um, will you share with them? It's basically a tracking system but it's the seed to sale tracking system in massachusetts it's also used to throughout another dozen states in the country uh, mm -hmm. and each state makes metrics uh, apply a different set of regulations and laws nothing is uniform did they explain uh, why they only gave you three days there, there is no explanation about anything uh, anywhere and when you call <laughs> metrics they say call the state and when you call the state they say call metrics um and so that that is uh, sort of some interpretation that needs to happen on our yeah. behalf to say, yeah. okay, here's what it says on paper. Here's what we think to be common practice. And, you know, we've got to kind of find that, that, that common ground of what seems. Well, and this is, efficient. this is really where you guys are at. This is the intersection of the legacy market and the regulated market. Yeah, correct. This so, is so the we, true, the true point of how do we get from, a to b yeah. right i mean so, it's really that's where you're at in massachusetts every plant that's over eight inches tall needs a tag and those tags cost us uh, i might have this wrong but 75 cents a tag that sounds about uh, right yeah it's something like that so if we run three thousand plants that's a, another twenty five hundred dollars that we have to worry about are you like able that. to reuse the tags we are not allowed to reuse the tags uh, and they're not very recyclable. So they, they get thrown out, unfortunately. So let's just round it up to a buck. So you, yep. you, you said three, 3,000, right? Yeah. So, so that was our goal. Th 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 that was our initial goal. Okay. Now we're running a thousand. A thousand. Okay. But. So just in tags alone for the listener out there, uh, just to tag these with an RFID tag, you're talking about a thousand bucks each round. Yeah, correct. Yeah. And then as soon as that tag plant is eight inches tall, it has the RFID card and that stays with the, the, the plant for the life of it. So we can always trace it back to the mother and things like that. The thing I do like about the system is we took our first round of clones in March or so. 
Uh, so we're flowering out those clones now, and we know what mothers they came from. Where in the traditional market, uh, we tracked what plant did what, but we didn't track it that closely. Where I know that tag number 10 is now on tag number 2600, uh, and that's the mother of that plant. So I can kind of trace the lineage back when we're cloning off a plant, cloning off a plant, cloning off a plant. A lot mm-hmm. of useful information that yeah. certainly come with it. That's the good news. Yeah, that is good. I mean, you know, you know, back to, you know, when before you've been to this point, I mean, could you imagine just spending a dollar on this little yeah. tag that you put in each plant? <laughs> well, I mean, I think, you know, from my perspective, it's like, you know, having grown for, for some time, I realized that you had to put a lot of money out, you know, to get, mm-hmm. you know, before you get anything back. Right. Mm-hmm. And that's something that, you know, in in the spirit of plant problems, that's something I think people in the regulated market need to be mindful of that, you know, it it costs a lot, you know, and it costs a lot to get started and probably a lot more than you anticipate. Right. So we have to put a tremendous amount of money out before we see any return. So, you know, every dollar, every tag, you know, everything, it all adds up. Right. And, and, and so does the flower, right. All the little Mm -hmm. buds add up to to big, to big bags of it. And so in that same spirit, it's, it's certainly a challenge, right being mm-hmm. six months being six months into it uh, the first problems that we really hit was uh, we started our seeds right away uh, without having our irrigation skid yet and uh, we got a, a rock star irrigation system that can be controlled by our computer and can, is tied into our environmentals also uh, you mean you're not a, watering by hand we're not wandering by hand anymore. <laughs> <laughs> we did for a couple months. Okay, okay. Well, two good. months is good. I mean, there's. Yeah. I, I know new industry, new new areas where people were doing it for years. I yeah. mean, they were so, doing it in Colorado so we're for running, years. We're running a, a Damtex control system on our environmentals, uh, which also controls our irrigation too, and that's tied into an irrig- uh, an Anderson irrigation skid, uh, and we're running uh, the latest and greatest nutrients through that. So it, it's a big change. We wanted to go into this growing with soil uh, in a traditional organic method. Uh, Chris can speak on some of the troubles and why we changed on that. So you yeah. guys have switched from, you guys are in a different media now. Yeah, we're growing in a cocoa, you know, okay. which is which is to me is still a, a pretty sustainable sort of medium, mm-hmm. right? Um, over peat, but yeah, we're doing it in a sort of conventional model, right? A drip mm-hmm. system in cocoa, um, mostly due to state regulations and efficiency, right? What what there were the regu- opp- Yeah, what were the regulations um, just, that kind of you know, pushed I think you that the direction? State, it, again, it's it's like one hand doesn't seem to talk to the other, so yeah you know, the state kind of comes up with these rules and they kind of defer some of the regulations onto like uh, the EPA or something, right? Um, when they have language that dictates different things like, oh, your soil needs to be tested and, and, and microbial growth. And it doesn't seem as if there's being many distinctions being made between good bacteria and bad bacteria. Exactly. So, um, Th- there's a lot of good bacteria in soil that when they test it in the Massachusetts market, it's bacteria and it... it, it makes you fail test and it's not to say that it's not something that we can do in the future and certainly myself i'm a proponent of that so i do hope to get back to that model at some point um but there's there's learning to be had in all of it which is good right like sounds like they don't understand agriculture exactly yeah 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 and that's pretty common for growth i mean i think what we see in these you know you might have seen it tony in in colorado or in other states whereas they start pretty stringent, you know, and mass is still kind of in the, the beginning infancy stage of, of legalization. So they start heavy handed. So it seems, and then they begin to kind of let it grow and let it build and take suggestions from, from people who are operating in that market and things have the opportunity to change. So we're hopeful that as the, you know, the state and the, in the, in the, in the public in the community and the consumers, the you know, become more educated about, these various aspects of the industry that we can hopefully, you know, bring our special touch to it. Right. We, we recently had a, a state representative a, from a different district come in tour our facility because uh, us being in the greenhouse uh, and being sustainable, uh, she had no idea what she was voting on. She was very pro cannabis and mm-hmm. was happy that the laws that she was voting on were to loosen it up or to legalize it and regulate it. Uh, we gave her a walk through a tour and I told her about all the regulations and all the problems we're having. And she said, thank you so much. Uh, these are the, the little nuances that we didn't mm-hmm. know that existed. 
So I can take this information now, go back to my groups in when we're passing the next round of late regulations, I'm going to definitely take these thoughts into consideration. Well, now you've got a connection too of a political to connection. Yeah, like we were talking exactly. about associations last time. I mean, that's really where you get into helping mold these regulations, right? These because people are coming to us to learn now. Exactly. It's not yeah, which is really you know, cool. it's, yeah. it's who you know sometimes, yeah. right? Yeah. So exactly. uh, we get we start our first crop J- January twentieth. Uh, we don't have our irrigation skit, so we have to hand water. We're hand watering everything. <laughs> we move them out of the little baby room. We put them into the bedroom, which is still under LED lights, and we keep watering them. Uh, they grow up. They touch the lights, and there's a, a snowstorm in Oklahoma uh, oh. this winter. They shut down the whole Midwest so they couldn't ship our irrigation skid for another 15 days or something like that. So you guys improvised. It, yeah. So, so, we, so we're hand watering. We're cutting the plants, topping them down as much as we can. They finally get the skid, get it up and running. We're excited. We put the plants into the greenhouse. But now instead of doing very small plants into the greenhouse, we're putting three foot plants into the greenhouse. Okay. Okay. Um, my brother did an amazing job with the uh, environment in the nutrients getting delivered. And those plants quickly went from three feet to six and a half, seven feet, which is awesome. And you're like, whoa, I got all this weed. But at the same time, it starts falling over and it starts mildewing. It starts getting bud rot and you're mm-hmm. growing stuff that you were throwing away. Uh, so, so there's that terror line right there that, so, so you've got, you got the height, which is awesome, right? When there's no flowers yeah. going. So, yeah. you know, f- explain to a you know, listener a little bit more because not really under, it's hard to understand until you see it happening. Right. Yeah. They grow quick, right. They grow quick. So <laughs> you know, start, we should start small, right. That's, that's one thing we reiterate, but they plants grow very fast. And especially with this hyper accelerated environment of a greenhouse, and, you know, the dual spectrum lighting that we have because greenhouse does have some HPS light as well as sunlight. So the plants just rage. They just take they take off. And, um, yeah, that was just one challenge. But, you know, I think we did pretty well with it. Um, so you guys are staking them up, right? You're we going did some around. Trellis. Yeah. We did some staking. Did some trellis. You know, okay. and, that's, and that's kind of normal, normal yeah. you know, standard operating procedure. And that's that's mm-hmm. our goal always is to make sure the plants are well supported with a lot of airflow. Um, but that, that was certainly a challenge. And when we're going through this greenhouse too, we have to think that uh, we just hired our fourth employee right now. And at that time we had one employee who was the, the head of the office that, that was taking care of all the paperwork and all that stuff. So it's me and my brother in there watering these things and battling huge plants, trying to de-leaf 3,200 square feet <laughs> it is, is a whole challenge in itself that it's, it's not a day of de-leafing. It's a week, it's maybe two weeks of de-leafing. Pretty labor intensive, isn't it? Yeah, and that's been one of our certainly challenges with the, the new business is just finding, and of course, with COVID times in 2020 and going mm-hmm. into 2021 is, is staffing, right? I think not just the cannabis industry has felt that, but a lot of industries and just finding good, reliable, hard work and people who want to hustle and have fun and, and build a healthy environment. So that's that's certainly been one of the challenges this past year and again into this year. Yeah. Um, it's just just finding good help. And, and we've been able to find some and everyone we have now is awesome. And we've have a, a stellar small workforce, but we didn't go out and hire, you know, 40 people. Right. With some of these facilities run with or with mm-hmm. two to three shifts operating where we have, you know, one shift. And, you know, there's a lot of sweat equity to say, you know, mm-hmm. so we've, mm-hmm. we've kind of grinded through it and and we're still in the hiring process. Right. And we're still in, in the team building process and kind of the the company culture building process. So we're just it's all growing. It's all just super new and we're we're figuring it out as we go. You gotta be careful what you wish for. Um <laughs> Chris <laughs> yeah. and I uh, had this dream uh, a couple of years back, and we knew that we would grow uh, the highest quality cannabis uh, that we anybody can see, uh, but we didn't necessarily figure uh, if we're going to grow a half acre, what's that going to take? Uh, how many people is going to take? How many people is going to take in the trim room? So we have a post-production team right now. And now how many people do we need in the greenhouse to de-leaf? Because the guy trimming he can't go de-leaf a greenhouse. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of staffing issues. Trying to relay those issues to our other business partners um, who don't necessarily 
they enjoy in respect and like cannabis, but they don't necessarily know how much work it is. They're, they're fast learning and seeing what we're going through. And Chris is saying, we need 15 employees. And I'm saying, well, I think we can get by with 12. And they said, well, we have eight parking spots out front. So can't we do it with that? And suddenly everybody is pulling their hair out because we are just, uh, we need more staff. So the, I, you brought up, you brought up a good thing that I'd like to talk about for a minute is okay. This business partner relationship, because from what I understood, I mean, they're, they're entrepreneurs as well, but their, their expertise is, was in fishing and, and other things. Correct. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So how, how do you find, because I know their challenges and I, kn- I know that it happens, but how do you find working through those issues? What have you found that does work the best or are you in the middle of trying to figure out what that works the We're, best? I think we've had a lot of good like team building exercises, whereas <laughs> okay. like they've been like really good to us in the sense that they are here to help us. Right. And we are a team and we realize that we need to figure out how it all works before we can have somebody else do it. So it's been challenging. And I mean, I think it's been good in the sense that they're helping us. We all jumped into business together, not really knowing each other. We kind of knew of each other <laughs> distantly. Uh, so we're definitely learning each other yeah, now. We're building that relationship. And we're learning each other's faults pretty quickly too. Uh, I have a bunch of them for sure. Yeah, uh, yeah. They see that me and Chris uh, sometimes go at it. You know what I mean? We argue <laughs> wow. about you should have put this many milligrams in, not that many milligrams in. It's week two, not week four. It's a... Uh, little things like that. I think part of the challenge too is just like aligning common goals, right? Like, whereas like Matt's business success, you know, is slightly different than mine. Yeah. And and our business partner's vision of success is slightly different than mine and Matt. So it's kind of trying to find those common threads, you know, that's, it's been a challenge, but it's been a good challenge. And I think we're all, you know, like I said, team building, we're all coming together. And we're fortunate that the the deal our partners signed up for were over double what they originally signed up for. And there's been a couple of different contracts that have gone back and forth for, with us. And some of them had to be renegotiated in between us. Mm-hmm. And some of them had to be... Yes, they've, they've been all in with us. They, they, right? There's a lot they of checks. Been we, we've been back and forth. And uh, I couldn't say enough nice things about them for sure. Well, you um, know, the the one thing is just that communication just becomes so key yeah and it's tell me how hard it is to create that while you're trying to grow while you're trying to uh water the plants while you're trying to hire i mean how do you so chris how do you has a business manage yeah that? chris has his own business uh up north ipk with people up there running a uh, our uh, one of our partners has a fishing company a yeah. small one. Uh, one of our partners has a, a real estate company, and then one of them is, is a lawyer. Uh, so they're all independent people. They've all mm-hmm. been. We've all never been employed by anybody, and I'd say we're all unemployable. Uh, yeah, yeah. But but it goes to Chris can talk about that balance a little bit. Yeah, I think listen, communication has has come up. You know, we've been like we got to communicate, and we got to have text streams, we got to have email streams, we got to have physical meetings. We have to have phone meetings. So yeah, communication is king, you know, and having an open dialogue and being able to kind of be frank and, and, you know, do it as polite as we can and be as cordial as we can, but be as direct as we can, and you know, recognize our deficiencies, our shortcomings, because, you know, we're not sitting here like, well, what do we need to do to be successful? Because, you know, we have a lot of the answers, certainly not all of them, but, you know, given the experience that we all kind of come with, we have great things we can add. But it's who's good at what, you know, it's kind of like if you had a, you know, work in a restaurant for a day or with a group of new people, you got to kind of find who fits where, you know, who's good mm-hmm. at what, who does what best. And that's still growing, you know, that's still mm-hmm. all developing and it's kind of unfolding as we speak. But it, like you said, a lot of it's about communication and we've been fortunate to have a lot of it. Like, and, and being that it's such a small company, there's a lot of accountability. There's a lot of I can call our partners. I can call Matt three times a day. And we yeah. have just a lot of talks. And we, we, we kind of constantly have an open dialogue. We never stop working kind of at the same rate. Yeah. Yeah. We're yeah. kind of always after it. So and we all want to be successful. So, but it, so it's kind of those, those have come through again, communication. Now we're at a, that relationship is at a very tight point right now, yeah. uh, which is a good thing because, uh, that harvest that we planted in January that had to veg for way too long uh, came down uh, three weeks ago or something like that. Okay. Uh, we are now drying it and trimming it. 
Uh, and every 15 pounds in Massachusetts has to be sent out for testing. Uh, okay. We sent that set test sample out uh, Monday. Uh, so just a couple of days ago, we set that sent, uh, test sample out. So now the big question is, is our first 15 pounds going to pass testing? If it doesn't pass testing, we can send it to extraction, but we're going to get half the money for it. Mm. But if it's the first 15 pounds we grew passes, all of a sudden we went from a company that is bleeding money to a company that is, uh, is starting to produce uh, capital. Yeah, you start start to attempt to cover your overhead, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so so you've got, I understand the business partnership. So let me ask you this. What do you guys do? Because it obviously creates a lot of stress. Um, good or bad, there's some stress that's happening between. What do you guys do to blow off steam? I like mountain biking. I like going to the beach. Okay, that's awesome. I like hiding in the gardens. Yeah. Uh, I mean, gardening for me is still like pretty peaceful. Okay, and it's good. you know, it's just it's just I think learning to manage it, right? Like yeah. everyone has stress in their life. Everyone experiences that, and you know, I think the fact that like Matt and I, at least the two of us, really enjoy plants. We love cannabis. We like to consume cannabis. So it's like it's just a dream, you know, it's a vision that we want to try to fulfill. So that that's very much satisfying in and of itself. Right. Mm -hmm. And there's just a lot to be like, you know, in a room today, just, Hey, we have to get the tags done and working with one or two people, just that sense of accomplishment is, is a big part of it. And, you know, I'll, it might not be fun, but again, I live a uh, five minutes from the facility. So I'm on the other side of town. Uh, we have the latest and greatest technology. I can check all the environments on my phone. Uh, and I can check the cameras on my phone and all that stuff. Uh, I still refuse to do that. And granted, I do it occasionally, but uh, every morning, seven days a week, uh, after I wake up, uh, do one or two things. Uh, I drive immediately to the facility. Uh, I do a walk around for about an hour to make sure that all the ramifications are where we want them to be. Uh, and then maybe I'll work for two or three hours uh, during the weekends. And then I come back in the afternoon again to check it to make sure she's going to sleep. All right. So Matt, let me ask you why, 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 why are you not using that technology more? Um, it's our baby. And there's a lot of things that technology covers 90% of what's in the facility. It doesn't cover 100% of it. Uh, so there are aspects that there aren't uh, smart yet that aren't hooked up to it. Uh, mm -hmm. Our water tanks aren't hooked up to that. So we have to manually check those. Um, yeah, it, it just more walking to the facility and feeling it. you're not going to notice that the bug outbreak uh, that's happening uh, over the camera, you, you, little things like that. You're just not going to notice that the door in the middle of winter is sweating and it's actually icing up and it's tough to get through. Uh, so it's more peace of mind. And to me, uh, if you love what you do, you'll never work, work another day in your life. So the building maintenance, the plant growing, the plant processing, trimming a uh, thousand pounds of weed is a great time for me. Uh, dealing with the relationships is, is gets tough with me. Me and my brother have been at the throat's end. You know what I mean? And same with me. It's a good thing you're partners. brothers, right? I mean, that's exactly. Part of it. <laughs> we, we can we can shake it off. No, we don't take that it so personally. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's, so, yeah, that's exactly so, right. Yeah. So you know, Chris, you know, he's talking about some very big deal and big deals like your, you know, you've got your your uh, door is sweating. You've got, there's some, there's obviously something that's off base, right? I mean, that's happening yeah. and not being able to catch that. I mean, for, for people that are like, well, I, I don't understand why a sweating door would be a big issue, but these little things that you see, how does that, how has that helped build or create your standard operating procedures? Cause I know I had a discussion with Matt about this uh, last time. And he said, you know, those, these are tricky things to do, right? It takes some time to build these. So how are you coming around to creating these with them and, and working? Cause I know that can be some issues. Like how is that working for you guys? It's, it's, it's working well, you know, I mean, in new England, we have like four different months, so we just have to remain nimble. You have to remain flexible. Right. And, Mm -hmm. And all the little things add up to, to having a successful garden and a ha happy, healthy plants. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's, we're, we're learning, right. You know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of unknowns, 
right? Like what we, we how we thought it was going to be is certainly sometimes different than how it actually is, right? Let's so. talk about how you thought it was going to be. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Uh, Fully control, you know, all control. Yeah. Like gardening <laughs> is a lot about control too, right? Like indoor growing. That's what like I base it all on. I mean, yeah. if I set the controller to, you know, 75, 78 degrees and 60% humidity or whatever it may be, what have you, you know, I expect to see that. And and then if it's not, then it's like, okay, well, let's go back to the drawing board. So we just well, you guys spent a lot of money on a greenhouse. Yeah, we're, we're, yeah. we're in a very, very fancy greenhouse. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That was a, uh, the salesman was an excellent gentleman. He was very nice to us, uh, but it was much like buying a, a car. Do you want power windows? Do you want power <laughs> locks? Do you want tinted windows? Uh, what rims do you want? And we picked what our budget would allow us, uh, thinking that would be the greatest combination. And Mm -hmm. there was a lot of things that we're we're coming from very small gardens and we're going into a huge facility. So there's things that uh, we designed perfectly and there's things that we designed or chose that were horribly incorrect. And we're going through throwing away brand new stuff right now and and trying to figure out, oh, we should have done it this way. Uh, I don't think it's uncommon, you know, as far as I've, I've, I've heard, it's like pretty common to have to do some of these like, kind of, you know, re- reevaluate where we're at. So we add with, some new equipment or... We're in an open air greenhouse. Uh, I won't call it open air, but we have a, a gable vent that sucks in fresh air and gable mm-hmm. vents that dump out uh, the air. So we're constantly sucking in fresh air. Mm-hmm. Uh, today was 90% humidity outside. Uh, how do you keep the garden uh, from not getting powdery mildew when it's 90% humidity out and your fans turn on every 10 minutes and we're sucking that air that's 90 degrees in? Uh, the way the greenhouse does it was they turn on the heat. So we blast our heat all day and open up the windows and try to just dry off the air a little bit as it goes across the plant. Yeah. So you're talking about, I mean, essentially you're in a, your climate is causing these issues. You know, I've I've had this discussion with uh, dozens and dozens of people. Uh, Even if you go to a different, let's say you go one city over, you could essentially have a different, completely different problem. Uh, yeah. Chris has been growing for a long time. You know, when you break down and you set up in a new spot, it's like, oh, I don't have this issue this time. I have this one. <laughs> and all of a sudden you've got to, no, you know, I, I agree with you. This isn't uncommon. The stuff that you're going through are, it's hard. I mean, how do you tell somebody that something you spent 20 grand on is shit? <laughs> <laughs> it's very difficult yeah <laughs> in, especially in your investors of, right i mean yeah, that's exactly. part of it right i mean so it's- they our cold air intake is on the roof of our building it, it opens up it cold air comes into the hallway it goes across the wet wall then it goes into the greenhouse mm-hmm. uh, those are 24 feet in the air and there uh, is screen that's supposed to stop all these little pests and bugs that were sold but as soon as it gets a little pollen on it it completely blocks out the airflow so it starts sucking in all the air from the cracks in the building and the doors and everywhere. Yeah. So we need to increase our air intake uh, by a hundred percent. We have to double it easily. Uh, so now it goes to, we just bought this building. Why didn't we plan for this? Well, fortunately, again, with the controllers that we have, it allows for us to analyze this information, to look at this information. And we have more ability than we've ever had to like look at it from a different perspective. Whereas I, you know, would, uh, would assess a lot of that by just look and feel in the past. Now I can go on a computer and print a report that tells me over the last week, what it's been over the last month, what it's been, what's the airflow been, what's the average humidity. What you're finding out now in your first six months, but that basically may have taken you what it could have taken you a year, maybe two years sometimes without having that data. Right. I mean, being a little, yeah. you, you know, you make an excellent point. I mean, that you're learning these hard lessons right now, but you're also learning them fast. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, yeah. And I feel like we, you know, again, I feel like we have, uh, you know, a lot of the answers. I feel like I know, a lot of what we need to do. I feel like we know what we need to do. It's just a matter of how quickly can we, you know, be successful with creating crops and getting some return on our initial investment. And it goes putting some money back into the business. Hey, you got 15 pounds out of your first crop. If it passes, I think, I think that's a successful growth for your first. No, no, no. (laughs) So our first harvest, a wet weight hanging was over a ton. Um, and we're yeah. not sure what does so that goes to the big question is now we got to wait uh, 30 days before it sells and we know in the metric system that we grew over a ton wet weight that's hanging up 
but does that dry down to 5%? Does that dry down to 10%? If it's 10%, okay, we get 200 pounds maybe. Is it 5%? Does it, how much is moldy? So now we're trying to say, yeah, we've got 15, 20 pounds in the vault, but we're still cutting, still cutting, trying to figure out what's that, what, what does it get to? It's probably, you guys tell me if I'm wrong, but it's probably one of the most uneasy times of growing. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah, it is, right? That, but it's that like, part, it's, just that part yeah. of like, how's it going to cure and dry up to like yeah. what, because, and you also, you know, I'm a little superstitious and I don't want to jinx myself, jinx myself yeah. and over predict and then under deliver that it's probably exactly. one of the most painful, like it can make your guts hurt on the inside just when you estimate opposite, half. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We've tried to be really conservative so through the entire process. It's, That's it's interesting now, a uh, rolling this facility open. Uh, we didn't start a uh, fill, uh, we didn't fill every room at once. Uh, we grew 1,200 seeds and that went into the first greenhouse. Uh, we took clones off of those, those went to the second greenhouse. So now we have two greenhouses full growing. And mm-hmm. we have our first harvest down that's in our harvest uh, post-production room, trim room. So for the past two weeks, I've been in the trim room with the whole trim guys. Uh, and my brother has been fortunate enough that he's on to grow uh, two and three, uh, looking at those plants and doing his whole thing over. And he's not necessarily in the, the trim room uh, dealing with that. Now it's a department of the company, which is kind of interesting. Yeah. In a tr- so are you guys trimming everything by hand or how are you guys trimming? We have, uh, we, we purchased one of the Green Bros Model M trimmers to assist us, right? To help us. So it gets, it gets you know, hands on it throughout the process. Um, but we are using some mechanical means to try to get us up to speed just based on the volume of product that we have. But essentially every, every piece of, you know, cannabis and herb will, will be hand touched and, and have it hand trimmed and inspected for quality control and all that. We, we bucket down by hand. We throw it into the green bros. Uh, I've been standing over that, working on it and, and working it down a little bit. And then when it takes the big leaves off, but doesn't start breaking up the buds, we pull it out of the machine and then we stick it on some stainless steel tables with the, uh, we've got three trimmers right now. The mm-hmm. guys are great. They're doing the best they can. And I can't say enough of them. Yeah. It's, it, it, it takes, it takes a bit of time to get good at it too. Right. Those guys. It does. Those guys are, you know, as long as I, I actually, I, I think it's one of the, uh, you know, the jobs that a day in day out doing that constantly, I think it's probably one of the toughest jobs in the, in the grow, right? Without a doubt. It certainly is. It does give you a lot of time for podcast listening too. (laughs) <laughs> very, I, 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 very I, true. I, I have listened to every one of your podcasts. <laughs> actually, <so. laughs> yeah. yeah, it's it gives you it, it gives you a lot of time. I mean, it's uh, you know we used to say uh, you know we we talk to the guys in trimming like less talking, more chopping. You know, it was kind of yeah. the motto because it can be really easy to get lost into a conversation. And, and you, you want these guys to be, you, you know, teammates and stuff, but you also want to be productive at the same time. So, so, so it goes, it goes a lot to design of the facility too. Uh, mm-hmm. things that I was thinking about. Uh, we have uh, two stainless steel tables. We can fit uh, four to six people at them. Uh, those stainless steels are on walls that don't face each other. Mm-hmm. Uh, so those three guys are back to back, which uh, I don't know, maybe it helps cut down on the chit chat a little bit. Uh, it more makes it a, a teammate thing where one table is working against the other table. Uh, so it was kind of where if we're all sitting around a folding table and we're all facing each other, uh, it tends to open up conversation a little bit more. You've just listened to another insightful episode of Plant Problems. If you like what you heard so far, don't forget to tell your friends and colleagues. For additional resources or to leave a review, head over to plantproblem.com. Join us again next week on Plant Problems with Tony Frisch Connect. We look forward to having conversations with you as we go along this journey.